Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to uh, this ITIF event on uh, the uh, impact and role of cloud computing on developing economies. I'm Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF, and we've got a, a two great presenters of a, of a report, um, uh, Peter Cowie and, and Michael Kleeman, unlocking the benefits of cloud computing for emerging economies, a policy overview. And, um, and then three great panels, so I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, but this is a really important question, important issue, because uh, as the IT uh, com communications uh, system evolves much more to cloud-based applications, uh, increasingly countries are looking to take advantage of that and to get the benefits. And the benefits can be quite substantial, not just for developed countries, uh, particularly countries like Japan, where they see cloud computing as a way to break down these these silos, these sort of custom-built software systems that the enterprises use to, to move to much more open and off-the-shelf systems, uh, but also to developing countries where this can be a low-cost uh, way to access uh, IT capabilities that they might not be otherwise able to do. But on top of that, one of the big challenges is that a number of countries now are embracing what we've called uh, cloud mercantilism. Uh, where they see this benefit, uh, but they think, oh, we can get even more benefits if we force cloud providers to actually uh, put servers and, and facilities in our own in, in our country. Uh, so they see it as a way to erect trade barriers to data flows, then they get the servers. Uh, and it's not just in countries like India and Argentina they're doing this. Uh, even countries who you would think would know better, uh, Australia being a good case in point, uh, I was recently in Sydney speaking to the cloud computing uh, task force for the government, and I happened to review a government report that was written uh, on cloud computing, and they actually said in the report, we can use the Patriot Act in the United States literally as an excuse to make uh, our, our um, to basically require data centers being based in Australia, not in the United States. So they knew it wasn't real. They knew the Patriot Act was not a real reason, but they were going to use it as an excuse in order to get a few more data centers in Australia. So this is, I think, an important question. How do we avoid the kind of bad cloud policy, if you will, and at the same time, how do we support good cloud policy? Because it has very, very important beneficial effects, uh, particularly for developing countries. So uh, we've got, as I said, uh, two great presenters here today. Uh, my colleague and friend Peter Cowie, uh, who is the Qualcomm Endowed Chair in Communications and Tech Policy at UC San Diego. He's also Dean of the uh, International Relations School there. Uh, Peter is uh, really one of the leading experts in the world on ICT and development. Uh, his special expertise is on, uh, is, is, on that is on that point. He recently wrote a book called Transforming Global Information and Communications Markets, The Political Economy of Innovation, MIT Press Book, which I would encourage you to read. Uh, he's a research scholar at the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology. He's also a non-resident fellow at the Annenberg Center of Communications. Uh, in 2009, he spent a year at USTR uh, as a special counselor to Ambassador Kirk, uh, where he was charged with responsibility for overseeing trade policy, and including USTR offices in the Americas, Europe, and Middle East. Uh, and he was also, uh, I don't know how many panels in D.C. have, uh, have two, uh, ha a former and a current head of the International Bureau at the FCC. Uh, this may be unprecedented in Washington history, but... Uh, who knows? Uh, Peter was she former. She doesn't usually allow me to appear with her. <laughs> that must be it. Uh, yeah, Peter was former chair of the International Bureau at the FCC uh, back in the 90s. Uh, his uh, counterpart, uh, Michael Thiem. Michael is uh, a senior fellow at UC San Diego uh, with the Interna School of International Relations. Uh, he has been a former vice president at the Boston Consulting Group and a director at Arthur D. Little uh, and a founding executive at Sprint International and Wiltel. So he has a deep background in technology and business, but also a scholarly research focus. Uh, and a lot of his work in telecom, uh, both work and policy, has been in developing markets. Ken uh, Zita is the president of Network Dynamics Associate. Uh, Ken specializes in ICT opportunities in developing countries. Uh, he's advised on behalf of private investors, lenders, and international organizations in over 50 countries. 
uh, including a number of fragile and post-conflict economies. Uh, after 9-11, Ken was the principal U.S. telecom advisor to Afghanistan, where he defined the blueprint for the nation's post-war information infrastructure. Uh, he's also uh, been very active in advocating the theme of state building in the digital era, the case for ICT in post-conflict and fragile economies, and has argued uh, quite um, persuasively to the U.S. government that ICT is, should be an essential component of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Min Del, De La Torre is the uh, chief of the International Bureau at the FCC. She's been in that role since 2009. And in that role, she leads all of the FCC's efforts internationally, which is not much going on, I think, on that it's these days. Quiet. <laughs> it's kind of quiet. Something about Wicked or something uh, happening in December. But uh, uh, so, as you can imagine, she just has her hands full now, particularly with uh, the ITU and Wicked, uh, you know, potential threat to the current internet governance system. She um, was previously at the FCC in uh, between 1994 and 98 as Deputy Chief of the uh, Telecom Division of the International Bureau. And before returning to the FCC now, she was President of Telecommunications Management Group Incorporated and again focused on a wide variety of issues around international uh, telecom policy. Um, and prior to that, she was at, uh, spent four years at, at NTIA, National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Finally, uh, Bernie McKay is the Intuit's uh, Chief uh, Public Policy Officer uh, and Vice President for Global Affairs. Intuit, as you know, is uh, probably the leading company in the world providing uh, uh, IT services to uh, small businesses and increasingly around April 15th to most of us uh, who have to file our taxes. Um, prior to uh, joining uh, Intuit in 1998, he was a former vice president for AT&T uh, and led the emerging market, global markets business development group at AT&T. He's also had positions at the U.S. Department of Energy and EPA uh, and has a wide uh, experience of working with other countries around the world on these issues. Uh, Bernie is also going to have to leave a little bit early, so um, uh, just announced that ahead of time. So, uh, Peter, do you want to take it away? Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, as you were talking about uh, the idea of having the need to encourage good policy and discourage bad policy, I was thinking about uh, my doctor talking about cholesterol, and uh, I don't know uh, if that's the right analogy, but in some ways uh, it uh, sets the framework that we have a balance out there uh, in a debate uh, where people are both excited about the opportunities of the cloud, but also uh, pessimistic about its imp implications. And that struggle is going on inside each of the major emerging markets around the world. So let me uh, uh, begin this, and then I'm going to hand it over to Michael, and then I'll return to the podium. Let me start by... It's right there. Ah, there it is, cleverly. Let me uh, outline the basic approach of this project, which is that we want to take a look at the overall trends in cloud computing, particularly in its implications for big emerging markets. So we look both at the development of the cloud as a technological system and then its intersection with big emerging uh, markets. <coughs> we Second of all, try to attempt to look at the policy implications of the cloud as it's emerging in those economies and thinking about its intersection with these global technological and market trends. And the third thing that we did in this uh, uh, study is combine two broad uh, papers that look at the overall implications for the world economy and the global south with three very detailed country case studies of India, Mexico, and South Africa so that we could get past the occasional example of what the cloud does to a much more systematic look at what is happening on the ground around the world. So let me uh, begin uh, before we get into the details of the cloud as a technological logic to uh, three or four points that we want to make just about its broad impact for emerging markets. 
And the first point we just simply want to make is that the cloud is central to global competitiveness for these countries. In other words, this is not a decision uh, about what Japan or Australia or the United States or the EU are going to do. It is a decision about fundamentally how they will position themselves in global competition. And, and the reason for this is something that Rob Atkinson's work uh, underscores brilliantly, which is that fundamentally it's not just computing and software and traditional information services that are intersecting with the cloud. What is happening is that all forms of services and goods are becoming increasingly dominated by value propositions that are tied to information technology and capacity. So if you would, we are dealing with a world where ideas matter more and even traditional goods and services. And we are dealing with a world where the intersection of information capacity with traditional categories of goods and services matters more and more. Um, in manufacturing, if you take a look at the value propositions for more and more of the goods that are emerging from the countries that we have studies for, information technology matters. Um, I recently had meetings with a large Indian conglomerate that is entering the transport equipment market. Half of the presentation was about the information service component to that particular uh, venture. The second point that we want to make is that we have already seen a transformation in the world economy. Today, uh, the share of South-South trade in the world economy is now about 40%, actually over 40% of world trade flows. And that percentage is likely to grow over time. And so in this South-South uh, trade pattern, it's important to recognize that the sophisticated value of information becomes important for competition and growth among the emerging markets dealing with each other. And our case studies reflect that point. <coughs> the third point we want to emphasize is that all of our uh, case studies uh, reveal that cloud computing is already starting to affect the dynamics of growth of small and medium-sized enterprises in big emerging markets. They are, in effect, lowering the cost of creating companies and expanding them. They are expanding the markets available to those companies rapidly. And they are allowing and, in fact, stimulating uh, job creation in these economies. And I'll we'll return to that later. And finally, uh, there is an aspect to the emergence of the cloud that uh, has not been fully appreciated, which is that it is now conventional wisdom in circles like this that the growth of broadband communications capacity is a long-term boost to economic growth and productivity around the world. So that's an accepted piece of economic uh, wisdom today. But what isn't fully understood is that the economic case for actually building out broadband in developing markets is improved with cloud computing because cloud creates actual value applications for broadband that allows for accelerated uh, build out of broadband. So these are complementary and reinforcing market and technological developments. Now the question then turns to What's the logic of this technological capacity? I'm going to turn that over to Michael. Thank you, Peter. So really briefly, most of you are probably familiar with the cloud. I want to just go through a couple of uh, framing definitions in just one picture and then talk about some of the underlying uh, dynamics. So what the cloud is is basically the ability to deliver a set of computing functionality remotely driven by um, large-scale computing processing connected by broadband networks. And it's scalable and on-demand capacity anywhere you can access it. Um, most of the delivery is over broadband because the cloud tends to rely on thin clients, things like web browsers or other relatively light applications on the user device. And in order to get good performance, it's certainly enhanced with broadband, although some cloud applications use uh, interfaces as simple as uh, text messaging or SMS. Um, cloud is big and it is getting bigger. Uh, Gartner projects that of, uh, around 60% of the server uh, resources in the world will be available through cloud activity. 
Um, it's the largest growing consuming function of new processing and disk storage in, in the world. And I'll give you a couple of points on scale in a second. Because of the scale, the cloud fundamentally alters the economics of IT services. And so if we try to understand what is driving the cloud, it's not the technology by itself in terms of, oh, this is an interesting thing to do, and I can access Salesforce sitting in Botswana. The fact of the matter is it fundamentally alters the underlying economics of the delivery of applications and content. And therefore, it's that economic that will drive it forward much more than the technology. The technology makes it possible, but that's not what makes it survive or makes it win. So this is sort of a classic picture of the cloud. Um, we think that uh, the that NIST provides sort of the one of the best reference definitions. Um, and basically, what you have on the top are some of the attributes. I'll go through them real quickly. You've got broad network access is a really important attribute of the cloud. If you want to place a cloud serving center, like a large data center or what Apple just built in the south with, for, to support iCloud, it has to be connected very richly to broadband networks to allow connectivity. Likewise, for the cloud to be effective, the users need to be able to access that resource. They also need to be connected in a relatively reliable and robust manner. Um, the concept of elasticity is really important. If you're running something like a content delivery service and you are, as an example, CNN, and you're trying to serve people watching the election results two nights ago, you can't afford to build a server environment on your own that will only be used at that peak. You can offload it to a cloud service provider and you'll pay for what you use and they will be able to scale gracefully because they have a large dynamic pool. And by the way, that pool is interconnected globally so they can shift loads around the world to deal with activity. It's measured, so you pay for what you use. You don't have to pay for standing capacity. Right? As I said, it's on demand. And this concept of resource pooling is really critical because that's part of what allows you to get the true economies of scale of the technology. And then the middle bar sort of shows the three main flavors of cloud service. We're almost all familiar with software as a service. Um, Salesforce.com or if you use Dropbox or any of those things, those are classic software as a service or people like to use the acronyms of SaaS. Um, platform as a service and infrastructure as a service are sort of moving backwards a little bit. Platform as a service is basically the idea if you want to be a web developer you can take your application but you'll get the basic tools and the environment to host it so <coughs> like a, a web server and accounting and a bunch of other things but you're building your app on top of it and that's a real function that's a value in developing economies because people can develop apps stick it on a cloud server in Africa and have it available to people around the world with the same performance as someone sitting in Los Angeles or New York all right. And infrastructure as service is basically, I'm going to buy a stripped down processor, a set of cycles in capacity, and I can do it dynamically. And there's various flavors of cloud. We're all familiar with public cloud. Private cloud is very commonly used in government or by large enterprises or collections of enterprises like banks. You have sort of a hybrid in some of the banking institutions. use a hybrid cloud, which is private for most of their use, but public for, say, e-banking. Right. And then community. So... Why the cloud needs scale and scope is really important. And we're going to argue that for the cloud to be successful, it needs to be big because you need to take advantage of scale economics. And we like to say that the cloud takes advantage of something I call M3, or Moore's Law cubed. You're all familiar with Moore's Law, which is the doubling of computing power, basically the same price point every 12 to 18 months. Well, the similar curve has gone on with storage. If any of you can think about the amount of storage you have in your laptop, and if I could tell you, Ten years ago, for $500, you could hold a billion bits of information in your hand. You'd laugh at me. Well, think about what's going to be coming in five years. So that curve is also accelerating. And the, and the curve that's actually faster than those two is the increase in fiber optic transmission speeds. We now run fiber optic networks, <clears throat> and the reference base speed off the shelf of a typical fiber network now is 100 billion bits per second per lambda. So 100 billion bits per second per single light beam going down, and you can have upwards of 100 in a single fiber pair. So the old story about I can move the Library of Congress from the East Coast to the West Coast in three minutes, I can do it in six seconds now. All right? And it's only accelerating. All right? And it's all a function. And the cloud takes those three attributes and <coughs> levers them for economics. But you only get that benefit if you really go to scale. So a typical data center is a half a million to a million square feet. 
the, the, the at Tokyo Data Center in Japan is so big they have their own train station. All right? I mean, this is, this is the old joke about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. How big is the universe? It's big. It's really, really big. All right? And one of the reasons you need that is you want to be scalable, you want to be able to be dynamic, and you want to take advantage of that economic. And therefore, if you have a subscale cloud service center in a country, you won't be able to be competitive with someone who is bigger and has more dynamic ability to move resources. All right? Most of the centers around the world are interconnected, so they can shift loads. Um, Google, Amazon, a number of other major players actually roll their loads around the world because they have different temporal peaks, so they can actually push their stuff around. And then lastly, you do want to have global cloud centers in the south, and these need to be interconnected by the international submarine and terrestrial cable systems. The good news about those is those are fiber optic, they're running fast, and they're getting very inexpensive. All right. So, so the, the basic picture is the cloud is an interconnected environment, and therefore for it to work, you need to have free flow of data. So that's sort of the setup of the argument that if you don't allow information to move freely across borders, you can't take advantage of that economic. If you actually restrict that free flow of information, the very people that have the most to benefit from cloud services, which are businesses and entrepreneurs in the global south of developing economies, actually are prevented from gaining access to that economic advantage. So I could build a cloud service center, if you will, in Tanzania, do a lot of work in East Africa. There is no way if I do that, that will get the same economic as one that's serving all of Africa that may be hosted, for instance, in Kenya or the centers that are operating in London. You just can't get the same scale economic. So balkanizing these things actually deprives the people in those countries of the very economic benefit that the cloud can afford. And when people talk about data security and they're worried about, you know, I can't move data across national boundaries, we have been doing it for decades. And if you travel outside the United States and make a credit card transaction, ever get a swift wire transfer from another country, we've been doing it for years with some of the most sensitive information, your financial information, and it's never been raised as an issue. There are ways to protect it if we're diligent and we utilize the technology effectively. Pass it back to Peter for the interesting stuff. So, Michael has uh, given you the basic logic and advantages, but uh, what I'd like to do briefly is to talk about uh, its application and practice that comes from the case studies. So the first point that uh, Michael was making is really that this is a democratizing technology. It fundamentally allows the type of capacity and cost structure that's long been available in an information-rich environment like the United States to start to be accessible in poor countries or emerging markets. And that in itself is changing the way that people are using information technology already in emerging markets. So when we're talking about the cloud, we're not talking about a hypothetical entry in the future or a set of token responses where the banks are linked together across uh, their uh, branches in developing markets, or Microsoft is supplying Microsoft's needs. We're talking about real capacity that is already reshaping behavior in these countries. So the first example here is simply uh, in Mexico, the e-government portal, which uh, has moved to the cloud in 2011. And what Mexico has discovered is that they lowered the cost as they doubled the number of users to over 100 million people. So total cost went down while doubling capacity at the same time. And this was the beginning of the cloud application and its efficiencies in Mexico. And Mexico is moving its largest social welfare systems all onto the cloud. Because you can't build out government services in an effective cost structure in rural Mexico without this. Now, second example is the impact on small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, Michael has argued to you, again, that this is a democratizing technology, but this is already occurring at a grassroots level among local South African uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. If you have 100 employees or less, many of them because they're getting customer relations functionality, uh, via salesforce.com, have been able to expand rapidly. The broader set of numbers are that 
depending upon the context in these uh, uh, case studies, uh, the estimated cost of savings for information and communications capacity, which is a growing cost factor in all of these countries and their firms, <coughs> is being cut by one third to one half on average. And that implies a reduction in the total cost of scaling, let's say a 100 person enterprise, at uh, somewhere on the range of 5 to 20 percent, depending on the business application. And just simply doing a uh, simple uh, econometric uh, analysis that implies a large bounce for total aggregate growth and employment in these economies. And none of this is hypothetical. This is what is occurring on the ground. Oops, sorry. Well, we... Uh, Alexis, we... can you advance the slide? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Great, thank you. So let me take a third example from India. Uh, in India, uh, there's a couple of interesting things happening. Let me first point out that in India, we have a perfect example of the fact that simply because the very largest <coughs> cloud uh, controlled facilities that Michael was referring to still tend to be dominated <coughs> by countries out of the OECD region, it does not mean that there is lack of entry in the cloud infrastructure or, uh, arena. If you actually look inside of the OECD region uh, at the number of large cloud centers built in the last year or two, the dominant number of new centers are controlled by new entrants. This looks a lot like telecom did in the 1990s. All right. Number two, the emerging markets are getting into this game. Uh, we can't name names uh, because of confidentiality. But we discovered that, for example, one of the largest uh, Indian information technology companies is offering large-scale cloud services into Africa. It's doing it out of a hub in Singapore because it doesn't want to screw around with the Indian government. <laughs> but the capacity to enter is within the reach of these uh, companies. And here you'll see an example of the effects for a direct marketing firm. And this gets me to my last point. There is a presumption that often is run, you find in interviewing in emerging markets that says, this is a way of reinforcing the traditional hierarchy in the world economy. The people who control the big computing boxes, therefore control the high-end information services, therefore control the value added, et cetera, et cetera. This is an equation that does not hold in this environment because the effect of the big boxes, along with their complementary in a redundant a resilient system of smaller infrastructure for appropriate scaled activities in emerging countries. The effect of the big boxes is to actually reduce the cost and improve the ability to deploy innovation in information and content applications much more readily in a way that is fully competitive with the traditional wealthy countries. Let me uh, finally uh, just suggest what this means for policy. Uh, I noticed uh, Rob earlier talking about the idea that Australia is saying that, well, the Patriot Act provides an excuse for allowing us to retain uh, the uh, control over uh, the cloud. Could you advance the slide for me, please? Nope. We just. You're done. I'm bad. No. <laughs> so let me tell you briefly what this implies. The first thing is that a effective cloud policy is going to be only effective if it's done within a context of a national plan for ICT. That is, it has to be thought of as a complement to broadband policy. It has to be done, of course, with human capital investment. And it has to be done with a competition policy. The cloud is fundamentally a pro-competitive environment if properly used. And countries should take advantage of that. The second implication, of course, is that you want both the ability to move data flexibly across national borders because that's the very logic of the goal. Australia, in doing this, is uh, in a particularly peculiar situation because Australia's national broadband plan that's so dramatic came out of their engagement with the equivalent to cloud computing for research. 
And the argument was that Australia needed ubiquitous broadband to take advantage of the new large-scale computing capacity that could work, synchronize research around the world. That is the nature of information uh, possibilities today. The third implication is that for the purposes of economies of scale and scope and resiliency, that you shouldn't dictate by government policy where the facilities are. And again, that should be done inside of a competitive market for information services because in the long term that actually advantages entrepreneurs in these countries. Finally, the issues of security and privacy. The, there is a um, myth that the only way to protect privacy and security according to differing national standards is to insist that the data be in that country. Number one, this is a fool's errand because the data will move in and out of the country anyway. Think of the credit card example that uh, Michael gave, but think then also of trying to manage uh, SARS or any epidemiological threat moving across national borders in Asia. Data will not stay inside national borders if you're to take advantage of this computational infrastructure that we've developed. But the, aside from being a fool's errand, it fundamentally ignores the fact that we have the capacity to data tag personal data according to national standards. And that can respond to the differences in national standards. Now, does that mean that every country should have its own wildly idiosyncratic national standard? There are two points that we just want to make in closing. One is that national policies will work best if they are within a broadly consistent global framework. And the reason for that is it both builds business confidence and it makes your national policy more effective because there are complementary policies in other places that are reinforcing it. And number two, it is essential that uh, you do this within a broad global framework because really what we're dealing with here with privacy and data is not discovering a new problem. As the economist put it, we have long faced the issue of do governments have the right to open your mail? There is a long tradition of balancing rights of privacy and security. And it is within that context of shared experience that we can best evolve the particulars of an effective global framework for handling these issues in the cloud. So that is uh, the heart of our findings. Uh, we'd be happy to talk about the individual countries and case studies. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Bernie. I, uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the chance to uh, go first, not because uh, I have any particular wisdom, but because I have a, a, a tough schedule. Uh, but um, I do appreciate the chance to uh, to have been here for this uh, discussion and uh, on the panel. I actually think that, um, first of all, I think that Peter and Michael's uh, analysis is superb. Uh, and I think it is, is both factual and insightful. The, we can call it democratization. We can call it uh, global uh, equalization of opportunity, economically. Um, but however we characterize this, the 21st century internet economy is unlike any other economic phase this planet has been through yet. We do something illustratively, and you could pick any company and, and come up with something similar, but we, we do something illustratively in India that is profoundly simple, but entirely dependent on everything we've just talked about here. Uh, this is a, a service that is delivered over mobile, which in India is the ubiquitous technology that everyone has, regardless of how humble they are on the economic chain. This is aimed not at SMEs of 100 or less. This is aimed at family farms, single proprietor businesses, rural India, 
where there is, on a global uh, measurement, what most people would consider to be profound poverty. This little service is called FAFSA. Uh, overnight, uh, a million farmers have signed up for it. And what it does is instead of them taking their farm produce, and very often it's by an, uh, an ox-driven cart uh, or a little broken down truck, but instead of taking their farm produce to the most convenient mundi to sell it, this service tells them which mundi within a distance of their farm, their location, is offering the best price for the product. Well, the effect of that is it can increase the family income of that farm by up to 20%, which for people struggling below what we would consider poverty is profound. The opportunity of this technology and the information revolution and the equalization of access to information around the planet uh, has uh, extraordinary implications for raising the standard of living, raising the standard of education, changing the way people and countries interact with each other, the opportunity for a two-person business in a small town in India to address a global market, The issues in public policy, whether you're looking at India or Africa or, or uh, Australia, I think you have to include in that discussion, or Europe. Public policy issues uh, really are about how government intends to regulate the Silk Road of the 21st century. In many respects, this is not just about economic growth and economic opportunity raising of economies and standards of living around the planet. This is really, if you really want to put it in harsh economic terms rather than in human terms, this is about trade policy. If you think about 19th century and 20th century, 17th century economies, the levying of tariffs, the requirement of domestic content, domestic manufacturing, Domestic distribution, domestic ships of lading, you can easily translate those into the policy debates that you see not only uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, but in the Northern Hemisphere as well. In Brussels, the European Commission is wrestling with 27 countries' different perspectives on what cloud computing, data center, privacy, security, policies should be. And the risk that develops, and there's been some interesting work that, that has begun in, in Europe on this, is what this will do to the European economy if it is not forward thinking enough. If this Silk Road of the 21st century is not recognized as the Silk Road of many centuries ago was, as fundamentally central to European economic growth and be a part in a vibrant and robust way in the global economy. Now you can translate that to any region, you can translate it to any country, but these policy issues are going to come out either enabling or disabling the power of the information economy and what it can accomplish. That does not mean that consumer protection should be a secondary or tertiary consideration. There's an interesting debate in, in Rome at uh, John Cabot University recently about some of these issues and, uh, that I had the opportunity to attend. And a uh, member of the European Parliament who sits on the directly relevant committees to these policies talked about not being able to choose favoring business over the consumer. And in that choice, in policy, the citizen and the consumer must reign supreme. Well, Mark Twain would have said, who can argue with that? I mean, I, I, I mean, 
this is, I mean, how can you have democracies that wouldn't put the interests of the citizen first? I would suggest, however, that that's actually the wrong framing of the question. Both sides of the scale are the consumer. Consumer protection and consumer access to the global economy and information and both the democratizing and economic power potential of that for the individual and frankly for the small business which is the backbone of every economy on the planet. In Italy, the average small business has four people. Guess what? Mama, Papa, Son, and Daughter. It's a common pattern whether you're in China or India or Poland or in Britain, the nation of shopkeepers. How policy is developed that protects and enables the consumer both being vital to their future is the conundrum that we have now and the approach of consumers versus business as opposed to consumer protection and empowerment is how this debate has to be reframed. Both must be achieved. Access to the new economy, empowerment in that new economy, the democratization of the availability of information and how that will change the world. That's one of the interests it's very clear that any number of governments are afraid of. It's important. How this all turns out is going to matter to not only our futures, but our children's futures and their children. And so I would suggest that the issues at stake could not be more important, but we should not have a dichotomy of choosing good over evil. There are two goods here, and they both have to be afforded in how policy develops. Thank you, Bernie. Um, Ken. Great. Thank you, Robin. Mike on. Can you hear me all right? Better if the mic were on. <laughs> Just press it once. How are we now? We have a mic? You've got to press down and hold it. I've got a colleague here. That's our sit. Too professional. Um, I'll take a slightly different turn. Um, the conversation so far has been a very high policy and academic level. I agree with what the authors are saying. Of course, it makes sense. Cloud computing makes sense. It's a trend. Sometimes I think we talk about cloud as if it's some new special development. And it is. It's a new technology, but it's really an evolution of what we've had before. So it's not, it, it's not something that wasn't foreseen. We, we understand what cloud does. And from an economic perspective, the case is quite clear. Better economies of scale, lower costs, lower power requirements. It feeds through the whole information technology uh, delivery chain. Cloud is cheaper. It's better. Um, I'm a guy who is an advisor to governments. I'm an advisor to money, meaning to investors and technology people. And I'm in the field a lot, and including the cloud sector. I should also say that I was previously an operator. I had a company that built high-end data centers. So I understand how these things work. And very specific to our conversation today, I'm very active in the emerging markets. So lately, I've been looking at cloud computing projects in Vietnam, in Moldova, in uh, the Palestinian territories, and uh, hopefully soon Egypt. And I'm tracking China very closely. So I get it. I'm out there in the field. That's the point. That's a little bit different. So I don't want to talk about a, say, a systematic argument, but more how it actually plays out in the field and what's going on today, from my view. Um, the technology argument is compelling from the computing infrastructure. I won't digress. It's a compelling story. But to me, more important is not the economies of scale, but the economies of scope. Because it allows different things to happen, fundamentally right. different right. things to happen. And more than, there are lots of ways we can talk about this stuff, but most fundamentally it's about hosted services. Peter touched on that a little bit. The point is applications are not being run in the cloud, rather than being run everywhere else. So the topic today is cloud computing in emerging markets. And I think emerging markets perhaps a little bit differently. I'm not, I don't just think about Mexico and uh, you know, India. These are the 
big guys who are very capable. But I'm thinking about the next 150 countries. Because what's going on is that the shifts that we're going through here and in Europe are also taking place at the bottom of the pyramid or the middle of the pyramid in places that are not equipped technologically to understand what's going on. So the shift is big and it's happening there as well. So it's a great case to talk about India because they actually have the wherewithal to implement some of these technologies. But the fact is the impact is the same even in poor countries. So what does it mean when we say emerging markets? Are we talking about the marketplaces or are we talking about the governments in the emerging markets? And sometimes those things are quite closely related. So it's true SMEs in a small country that have got access to cloud can do more. My interest is in those governments themselves and how can you transform government in places that need help. Now, so for instance, someone mentioned uh, was it Tanzania or Kenya, either one. I worked in both places. And it, it, these are governments run by paper. They don't have backup computing facilities. They don't have modern networks. They don't have applications. They have no ability to integrate. They don't know what IP shared services are. They may get it, but they don't actually have it. And part of what's going on with the rapid advance of cloud and broadband at a local level is to be able to create a whole new infrastructure for government. So the government is more responsive, more resilient, better able, more transparent, better able to access the data that it already has, the form these services and in turn makes the government more uh, responsive to the people. At the end of the day, it's about what can the government do for the people. If it's education or healthcare or security or counterterrorism or whatever, you have to have the ability to serve the people's needs. The only way to do that is to get your data. So the applications to me and what they enable, the solutions, are more important than this thing called server virtualization, which is you know, this computing <coughs> technology. Um, <coughs> second is that I believe that based on these points I was just making, that it's possible to actually reinvent government at a local level. We've all heard about technology solutions for government. A big story usually doesn't work. However, this is a different game. Um, last year I had a team of about a dozen people working with the Palestinian Authority in the, Pal in the West Bank. And the assumption was that, okay, there's so many political problems, but if you really want to create a state here, how would you do it? And what you need to do to create a state for the 21st century is to be able to manage your information flow, which meant knowing how to create an infrastructure for information management at a government level. So we designed a national data center for the Palestinian Authority. I was in Libya this summer. One of the curious things about Libya with Gaddafi is that he was an anarchist. There's no government. There is no government in Libya. It doesn't exist. No institutions, no bureaucracy, no um, inertia for how information flows is an opportunity to use a cloud and a structured set of applications, whether it's from Intuit or Microsoft or Oracle or whatever, to create a systematic process that is more transparent, more efficient, more effective, more stable than what was there previously. So there's a great potential at the level of political management and stability. Um, typically speaking, the, the governments are involved they have a role in designing information infrastructure. Um, which leads to a lot of questions about what's appropriate for the market or government intervention. And I think the policy, you know, the policy analysts like Peter and uh, Michael are, are taking on these issues. It's, the question is, is it ever okay for a government to decide its data policy? Rob argues quite clearly, no, you know, the data mercantilism or cloud mercantilism is no good reason to ever do that. And what's happening on the other side is there's kind of a difference between um, data privacy and data sovereignty. And people are talking about the sovereignty of their data. And you can say, okay, if you've got a credit card transaction that goes out of the country, you can go anywhere. But what happens if it's the Ministry of the Interior or it's some other kind of very highly sensitive information about your people? Do you have a sovereign right to maintain that? I'm not arguing in favor, by the way, but this is the kind of thing that we hear in the field. You know, it's, and it's a little bit of a pushback from the forces that don't want competition. There's, um, you know, one of the points I heard uh, from Michael was that this is, with the cloud, you have the ability to innovate. You know, you can create ecosystems for a lot of things, software development, services industries. So everybody around the world is saying the same thing. I want some of that too. You know, I think we should do it. 
if Amazon did that for U.S. and so forth, why can't we here in Egypt create our own ecosystem? And why don't we put up the protections that we need to ensure our economic growth? So it becomes very much a political issue about um, the, the appropriate role of the state versus the appropriate role of the market. Very familiar conversation from the telecom sector, but now seeing it in the context of what some perceive as the vital opportunities for economic growth. Um, you know, can a national data center or a data center in a small country, an emerging market, compete on the global stage? Should they even try? Is it possible? Now, um, the, the, the presenters today made an a priori assumption about the data center has to be large scale, 500,000 square feet to a million. This is what we heard. Those are big data centers. That's what real big cloud facilities look like. But that's not to say you can't have a cloud data center the size of this room that can run Yemen. It, it really does not have to be at that scale. There are also other externalities and cost. Sometimes the telecoms is very, very expensive. So even if you can get to the cloud computing capability in, um, in the United States, for example, or in Europe, if you're in a developing country, it's still prohibitively expensive to carry the traffic. So it becomes an economic question of where and when it happens. Um, but Overall, why do governments choose to embrace a cloud? Partly it's a technology trend. Partly they see the ability to create an, uh, an ecosystem. And in some cases, they, they have to do something dramatic to achieve their own national objectives. So here's a case, Moldova. Very well studied now, with a lot of US aid funded projects and also World Bank to develop an M cloud. Now, the meaning a Moldova cloud, principally for the government. But they recognize that they have to do a public-private partnership. And the reason is very simple. They can't pay for it. The government is too poor to be able to design its own and deploy its own cloud computing capability. Um, so um, this is, becomes a case where governments are looking for ways to draw from the benefits of cloud without necessarily saying, oh, we should just get it from the Americans. And is a, they may work with IBM and Cisco to build it, but the point is they want to have their own facility because they can't run their governments. They cannot achieve their national objectives. Forget cloud and all that, just uh, without having the resources. So finally, and very briefly, it's uh, as Rob said at the outset, I'm, I'm very passionate about the fact that I don't believe that the United States government itself understands how important this cloud is in, in the emerging markets. I understand that at a policy level, we argue very strongly and consistently for open government data, for no restrictions on transport or data flow, on an open internet. Those are all the policy level discussions. Those are the levers that the US government is planning. But when it comes really down to the ground um, in poor, lower, middle income countries, um, I don't believe that we have an integrated approach from a US perspective to how the United States can help um, developed in those countries on high technology issues. So the government does its part, I know I'm handing over to the FCC. The government does its part, but it's really not a systematic part of thinking of our foreign policy. Great, thank you, Ken. And uh, Mindell, make thank sure you. you turn your mic on, please. Well, not only do you have two bureau chiefs, you have another um, international bureau chief, and then we have a uh, commissioner, actually, yeah. Commissioner Ness. So you have quite a few, um, and she was quite active in international issues when she was at the commission. So, um, you know, I, a lot of what everybody said is, has, has rung true. When, when I was looking through, you know, reading through the paper, I, I um, you know, started thinking about some of the places that I've been lately, and, and one of the first questions that Peter asked was, where have you been lately? And since I've been traveling for nonstop for seven weeks, I like, came back to a hurricane, I, I uh, thought, well, you know, some of them are actually emerging countries. And, and we just went to, um, Chairman Janikowski and I just went to Brazil, and um, Brazil and Colombia, and we met with um, a lot of innovators there. Um, one of the things that he likes to do is to meet with, with innovators, and we met with people who were very much using the cloud or broadband and needed the broadband infrastructure. And part of what we do, you know, um, what we look at from the FCC's perspective is that there's sort of three principles that are really important. I mean, first is that the, the consumers and the businesses trust the, um, the infrastructure and that they have the trust to be able to put things into the cloud. Um, a second is, I mean, part of what 
one one thing that people don't want is for the FCC to actually regulate in this space, right? So we're 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 in this sort of you know conundrum about what to do. But one of the things that we can do is we can promote policies that expand infrastructure and that and broadband infrastructure, including mobile applications like the one that um, that Bernie was talking about. Um, and then this sort of light touch regulatory um, emphasis. And, and whenever we talk, go around the world, we talk about that. And one of the things that we, we very much talk about, and it's a little ironic because today I sent an email to our CIO uh, because I had sent him a question from when I was in Japan recently. The Japanese asked me, I said, well, um, on the, the U.S. cloud computing policies, could you store your data? Could the FCC store your data in Japan? And I said, well, I think so. I don't think there'd be a problem. And he said, well, how about China? How about Russia? And I said, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> and so, you know, from our perspective, when we go around the world, we, we are very much advocating for a free flow of information, but our policies, are our own domestic policies reflecting that. And I think that's one thing that we and the government need to also put pressure on ourselves to, and, and, and we, we have, you know, I think one of the things that, that uh, Chairman Janikowski has been very interested in doing is is looking at that in our previous MCIO, um, that Steve is, is now the, I guess, the whole government CIO, and he's been working on, on a lot of those issues. But to get back to Brazil, um, we had this meeting with the innovators, and the innovators represented all these different companies that are doing exactly what you were talking about, um, you know, in, in your paper that they are doing South-South communications and they're doing business in Latin America. So they're starting a business in Brazil and then they're expanding to 15 other countries in the region. And the things that, you know, one of the, the questions that we ask them, well, what are the challenges that you face here in Brazil and what are the challenges you face in other countries? And the number one challenge that, that, that they identified was the regulatory structure. And I don't know if that's because we're regulators and they knew that, but the, the, what they were, you know, it was differing regulatory structures. The fact that Brazil itself doesn't have a privacy framework, and it doesn't have, and they, they are looking now to some laws that would um, basically mandate the data stay in Brazil. You know, all those kinds of things that you've identified as, I, I like that, that term, by the way, mercantilism. I think that's, you know, the cloud uh, mercantilism is, is, a, is a very good um, term. And so, you know, the, 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 the ones that want to push the economy forward are looking for these policies that would allow them to do it. They're still doing it, okay? I mean, there's a gap there, and that, I mean, that, 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 that gap you identified for each of the three countries that, that were, um, were looked at. And I don't see it that it's any different in Brazil. I don't see that it's any different in, in China. When we were, um, I was just in China two weeks ago, and um, met with some folks, and they were very much into, they wanted to have their own cloud computing, uh, basically region, you know, and that whole region. And um, when we were talking about, you know, we said, well, what kind of policies, domestic policies and international policies do you have? They were like, well, you know, the data all has to stay here. And, and we said, well, that is gonna, could be problematic for you to become a world player, a global player. And so, trying to explain to them that they were sort of cor you know, cornering themselves in and that they needed to, to come to these international norms, I think, is, is, is really important. Um, you know, we, we met with another group that we met with in Brazil, which was really interesting, was SEBRAE, which is a, um, think of it as the SBA of the state of Sao Paulo. Now, the state of Sao Paulo is like, you know, has, has one of the largest economies in the world, and they have one out of you know, they have one business for 122 people, so it's quite an a entrepreneurial area. And one of the areas that Sebrae um, mentioned to us that they are trying to work with all of their little companies that they're dealing with, these small and medium-sized businesses, is cloud computing. They say that, that most companies in Brazil don't have the slightest idea what cloud computing is. They're trying to explain to them, in fact, the bit, you know, the, the the fact that there are these these incredible economies of scope and scale, as you were explaining, you know, for these companies and for the and for the government itself, and so they're working with the government of Brazil and the government of São Paulo to try to get these things forward. So I mean, I I, I found um, a lot of what you said to be you know very it resonated a lot with what we have been seeing on a um, you know case by case basis, and then also from the point of view of you know what are we going to do in the United States to 
to sort of you know implement some of these these policies that we talk around you know we go around talking around the world and and, and uh, advocating and we probably need to be thinking about those ourselves. But anyway, great, thank you. Given the fact that uh, it's not uncommon, I know when Peter and I both go to China uh, as part of this uh, innovation group uh, with the, with the uh, White House, we're we're told fairly clearly uh, keep your laptop on your person at all times. Um, so perhaps China might be the exception here. They slightly different. I don't keep my laptop with me at all times when I'm in Tokyo. Uh, maybe I should. Uh, so before we open it up to folks, let's, I wanted to just give uh, uh, Peter and Michael a couple minutes if you just wanted to respond to anything the three uh, respondents uh, had said. Uh, uh, so uh, let me uh, begin uh, with uh, Ken's uh, very useful point about uh, economies of scope. In fact, in the papers we talk about the advantages of economies of scope and we totally agree about it, but we decided to simplify by talking about scale today, but you, exactly to the point. The second thing is that um, um, Mendel and Ken are in their intersection talking about something that's important to understand, which is uh, not everything's going to be done in the giant uh, mega cloud centers. Uh, we refer to this in our discussion of the architecture of the cloud as a hub and spoke system. Um, and so we are going to see localized cloud centers. And some of that is simply because of some of the advantages about communications costs, its resiliency, and in a world of unspoken uh, regulation, uh, that some things people are just too uncomfortable with, and so you lodge it there. But if it becomes a national policy, the data must be lodged in the country. And that is the presumption in the design of your information policy. Then you're walking into a big problem. And I think the point that we probably didn't stress enough in our presentation today is that the cloud is really opening up a whole new way of thinking about organizing our management of every activity in the world. Uh, the mobile broadband combined with uh, the fixed uh, fiber broadband means that we essentially have this enormously powerful infrastructure available for everything. So um, if you actually see a tractor that is now sold in the United States, it is like an airplane cockpit, right? And the reason is that da big data is now available in the field and you don't think about it. Furthermore, the business of a farmer in the future will be selling data about what they're doing in the field as much as worrying about what market they're being connected to. Uh, there is a transformational capacity here that requires looking at data references on a global basis and mixing and mingling them. And so these countries, and Ken is exactly right, it's not just the big emerging markets, although that was the place we could dramatically look at it at its first cut, are all going to be in the business of trying to take advantage in novel ways of this ability to use transformational data that reflects computing in a whole new way. And if you think this sounds too abstract, just think about the election we just finished. What was one of the big advantages of the Obama uh, ground game? It was because they figured out how big data could allow you to think about the mobilization effort in a whole new way, the people who were political pros hadn't thought about before. This is just the start of where we are. Uh, so uh, the last point I just make is that I think that one of the things that is critical to the public policy debate, as uh, Mindell was suggesting, is that countries like India don't want to have formal rules for the cloud that would clarify rights and responsibilities it's a lot easier to have ad hoc discretion to allow you to do what you want. And in fact, for these countries, when the first steps forward would be if they had rules that were transparent and consistent, evolving as they have experience, but there. The ability to do everything ad hoc is the enemy of getting exactly the type of innovation environment that Ken was talking about. And the sort of environment, the Brazilian entrepreneurs that Mendel was talking about. So 
So I actually just want to jump to people because I want to give everybody an opportunity. So I'll go in the back and then just say who you are and, and then we'll go in order of who I see. Fred Tipson, peace out. Uh, we seem to be dancing around the politics here, and, the, and the, the global conversation seems to be as much a dialogue of the deaf as the Capitol Hill conversation these days. A basic difference in values. Many of the powers that be in these countries don't place economic efficiency and poverty reduction as their highest priority. Their highest priority is rent, is, is, is taking rents out of the system, it's control, it's security, both in the wrong way and in the right way. And let's not be too uh, parochial here, our own authorities have incentives to want to have access to data and control over data for their own security reasons that probably make them more interested in having data centers in the United States or accessible to the authorities of the United States. So these, all these political motivations that are interfering with uh, the efficiency arguments that I think are so compelling otherwise, um, it's sort of back, back to the sort of free trade argument. Free trade is obviously overall to everyone's advantage but it's to the disadvantage of people who see other approaches as benefiting them in particular for various kinds of motivations. And, you know, the wicket is an illustration of governments having vastly different <coughs> priorities in terms of how they see information, which I don't think we can afford to take this conversation too far without confronting. Um, and, and, you know, cyber, and then the cybersecurity element also would enter in from a, from a positive Point for people who want to make sure that these these systems are resilient and protected enough to protect the value that's in them. Well, Fred, I completely agree that uh, we are flawed human beings. I'm an Irish Catholic, so I'm an eternal pessimist about uh, human perfectibility. Uh, but uh, the but I think that in fact we have a track record that suggests that we can do we can address these problems. You know, uh, if we were thinking of our common uh, friendship and knowledge of, over the years, uh, the communications infrastructure 35 years ago, you would have said the same thing about. Uh, and while the world's communications infrastructure and markets are hardly perfect today, including some of our own uh, laggard uh, uh, clearances of foreign investment in our communications markets in the U.S., um, nonetheless, uh, it's fundamentally different than it was 35 years ago. And why is it fundamentally different? Because we found a way of creating a concrete statement of the values that could be seized only by changing the way the market was organized and saying that that played in the interest of the countries that were serious about transforming their societies. So back then it was the Asian tigers were the starting wedge of that, right? And then other countries had to face the fact that there was a dramatic difference in performance. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's perfect, it just means that it's fundamentally different. And I think that, that is cap we're capable of dealing with that. Uh, the security problem is going to be the perennial problem, but frankly, I don't think this is any different than a lot of the security problems we've had in high technology elsewhere. Uh, it, you know, Security is always the dirty secret of open trade markets. There are always exceptions, but what you want to do is put those exceptions within as many parameters as you can so it's hard to be too blatant and general in the use of those exceptions. Right here and then here. Claudio <coughs> Lilienfeld with uh, Google. I, I guess it's just an observation, having heard the conversation, I think it's interesting that uh, the cloud has sort of been isolated out as something unique where really we're talking about issues whether Fred brought up and most of the principles that you've raised are really just more generically applied to the internet. Uh, there are some, there's a subset that's unique to the challenges governments face and what they do with their information and such, but I, I was wondering whether uh, there was a particular reason why this was elided uh, and, and not uh, brought out, uh, meaning that these principles do apply more broadly. I think the conclusions you draw are all very good and I think this is a very interesting conversation. But that, I think, equally, again, applies to this much bigger issue. And the wicked, of course, is uh, addressing that broader challenge as well. Right. So uh, you're, you're perfectly right. So let's stipulate to that. Uh, there are two reasons why uh, we prefer to do it this way. Number one, uh, I hate to sound like, a, uh, like an ancient uh, professor, which I am. Uh, 
teaching is much easier if there is a focus uh, for understanding a problem. And this is, at it's a public policy problem, a teaching problem as much as it is a politics problem. Number two, um, having wrestled with the question of broad internet principles uh, within a group of Europeans and US companies and government officials through the Aspen Institute for almost two years, uh, the one thing that was clear to me is that the cloud constitutes sort of a cutting edge. It is, a, if we get this right, the other problems get simpler. And trying to get a broad consensus on the open internet per se is like making the problem three times harder to get started. If we get this right, that second problem will become more tractable, I think. But you're quite right that ultimately that's the game you're in. Mark Massidi, Application Developers Alliance. Uh, this is actually a bit of a follow-up question as well. Uh, given that the, TP, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is currently the only major trade uh, bill going through the U.S. right now, and it's heavy focus on IP, uh, what you were talking about earlier with gaining global consensus, sort of like on global privacy and sort of data security, do you feel that uh, trade, this trade barrier that's currently being erected around data privacy will be the next major trade issue, will be discussed in bilateral? Uh, in bilateral trade talks, or will there actually be sort of a global, uh, similar partnerships coming through that would be able to define these privacy rights? And if so, do you feel that will be continuing with the ad hoc way we currently and currently correctly run the internet, or will this be more, will we see actually an establishment of something else under sort of a, a more a different organization? Great. Uh, Mendel, why don't you take a crack at that first and turn yeah. the mic on, please. <laughs> That's the person that should probably There's answer Jonathan your McHale. question. Jonathan McHale is back in the back. Um, Jonathan, actually, do you want to do you want to address that? You'd probably be better than I than I would at that particular issue. Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, great comments. Really appreciate um, having all this uh, brain power focused on these, these issues. Uh, we, we do have a, an attempt to deal with just these very much these very issues in in the Trans Pacific Partnership. A proposal that we not have local data centers be the rule, a proposal that we allow <coughs> data to move, move across borders. The difficulty that we're having in that forum uh, to sort of follow up on some of the, the uh, challenges that, that Peter's laid out here is you know, governments, this is all very uh, uncharted territory. So governments are feeling pressure from their domestic constituencies. They're giving up some sovereignty that they don't have control over what happens in, in this, this vague cloud, cloud space. And we're trying to write rules that saying we're trying to curtail some of that sovereignty. So I think that the, the challenge has, has for, for me as a negotiator has been to say, no, we, as Peter has mentioned, you can, for the privacy piece, have your domestic regulations follow the data and the companies can figure out a way to ensure that whatever rules you put will, will transported with the data. But the real dilemma, and it's something that we, we need help going forward, is, is governments are still hesitant that they are relying on the promise of a company to meet those uh, expectations and, and promises. But the real issue that, that I see is we don't yet have a structure whereby rules, whether it's for security or privacy in, in one country, can be enforced when there is a problem in that other location. The companies are willing to make the promises. The governments are accountable to their citizens for saying, okay, but what happens if there's a, if there's a problem? And I think there's certainly a way forward, but that is, I think, one of the big dilemmas that's really making the, the governments hesitant to actually move forward. One, one uh, final point, I had a very interesting <clears throat> conversation with the um, Canadians on this. They're putting forward a whole uh, infrastructure uh, government-run uh, thing for, for, essentially for cloud run by the government. The discussion there, and they're grappling with all these very issues, is okay, yes, data sovereignty, they're worried about Canadian personal information being, being put out there, and, and they're held accountable for potential breach. But we did have a very interesting discussion, and it's very much consistent with what we're doing in the U.S. in, in looking at different sensitivities of data for how you can open up one area to start building the confidence, to building the comfort. And so they, they, they're essentially dividing the world into three pieces, one classified, off the table clearly, 
personal information, don't quite know yet how to figure it out. There's plenty of other data that governments deal with that's neither classified nor personal that you can certainly have an opportunity to, to, um, to have subject to the more open. Can I just add to what Jonathan just said that it's, he's, he's exactly right about this issue of uh, government promises, of corporate promises versus government capacity. We didn't get the communications reorganization globally until uh, people like Susan Ness as an FCC commissioner and her counterparts around the world were willing to communicate with each other that they had a common understanding of the competition rules that went with it. Not that all the national competition rules were the same, but they, they were sort of in the same ballpark. That they understood that if a dominant legacy carrier was fooling around with new entrants, that was a problem. And they convinced each other that they all understood that that was a problem. And under the trade obligation to do something about it, we were convinced there were motivated uh, government agencies to deal with it. And so uh, this long-term solution is going to require ways of creating that confidence about the supporting uh, policy infrastructure. Can I just say one thing, I've done? To me, to me I, I wonder whether the problem is not simpler than what a lot of policymakers in other countries think. Because there's really only three categories of companies one could deal with in that environment. So one is a domestic uh, headquartered company that happens to locate their data outside. Doesn't matter where they locate their data, if they do something wrong, you have them legally uh, responsible. The second would be a foreign company that has nexus, that, that, that because they're marketing there, they have facilities there, uh, Google would be a good example. I think you probably have nexus in almost every country. Uh, again, you have legal jurisdiction over a company that you have nexus with. So it's really only this third company where they have nothing to do with your country, uh, and it just be people go on the web and they find them somewhere and they happen to be located somewhere around the world. And on those, to me, I think the, the answer has, needs to be some sort of globalized, agreed upon seal or, or notification program that says there's a little flag or something like that that says, you know, you, you're taking your risk here because you're not, uh, you know, you're, you're, going, you're not covered by your own country's data policies. But I, but I really think it's a lot simpler than... And by the way, the vast majority of this is going to be in category one, category two. Uh, so I think that it's again co countries using this somewhat as an excuse. Ken, did you want to respond? Like, yeah. um, listen, I, I'm all about having international structures. It makes really good sense. But when you have a structure, it also allows the uh, those who may be on the other side of your argument to also say, "Well, thanks, but we're going to have our own structure." We're going to agree to disagree. When you have in India, where things are opaque and subject to a lot of political influence and never too precise, probably, you know, sometimes it's malicious, but sometimes just capacity. You know, they just don't have the structure for it. Um, but if you put together a system that says, okay, these are going to be our agreements, and then the Chinese are going to say, yeah, mm -hmm, but we're going to use those agreements and do it our way with the Russians and the Saudis and so forth. So, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. And there's a lot to be said about having it be a little bit fungible in the near term. In the back. Hi, I'm Christine plus USTR. And I just wanted to amplify on a couple of the comments that Jonathan made. And again, thanks to all of you on the panel, to, to Peter and to Mandel in particular. Um, and, and one, as Jonathan said, I think we're not there yet. But certainly on the privacy issue, there's certainly an effort to work interagency with the Department of Commerce, um, with our colleagues at FCC um, and at State. So certainly we're trying on the privacy issue, USTR isn't in the need, but you know, I think as Jonathan mentioned, the problem we see is the consensus domestically, let alone internationally, but at least I think there's a willingness to start. Cybersecurity I think is a little more difficult. I mean, we make the same effort, but we're just not quite there yet. Um, the second thing I wanted to say to Rob's point is I absolutely agree with you that those are those three categories. One of the complications that we run into, though, is that for categories two and three, we're, we find that other governments are kind of at cross purposes because part of the effort that Jonathan um, described, which is in the context of TPP binding and Korea less binding, but sort of building process, is also part of a broader effort that we have on the ICT principle. 
And that's where we're really trying to seek the wedge, the country wedge that Peter was talking about from a trade perspective. And, and one of the things we're trying to do in the principles in terms of cross-border data flows is to also seek the elimination of local infrastructure requirements. So when you get between to the third category, that's where the fight is. Because a lot of countries, as you acknowledge, will cling to infrastructure requirements as a way to try and have a nexus, a legal nexus. Right. So, so that's one of the battles, you know, the policy battles is, is how do you create a clear delineation so that that third cross-border data flow can exist without the nexus of the local infrastructure requirements. Right. So, so that's one of the complexities. The last thing I would just say is it's much more nascent, but um, again, working with, with FCC, Commerce, State, Ambassador Bavir, and others, we are trying to propagate these ICT principles that we developed initially with the, with the uh, EU. Um, and we've got Japan, Mauritius, which may seem you know, not commercially as significant, but still important. Um, Switzerland is on the verge of signing with us. We're also working in the Middle East. And, and again, very nascent in that sense, but we've gotten Jordan and Morocco to agree. Um, we're working on Egypt and Tunisia as part of the VENA project. But, but again, slowly but surely, we are looking for that wedge of countries from a trade perspective that, that Peter talked about. So again, TPP is really where the action is in terms of binding commitments. We hope it will be in an international services agreement as well as that goes forward in Geneva and what we might do with the EU if we do a comprehensive agreement. Um, but just wanted to mention that, again, it's very early, nascent, but it is, we actually are trying to cast a wider net on a non binding Great. I mean, just the thing on, on three, and unless you're willing to erect a firewall completely around your country, three is always going to exist. Your citizens always will be able to go to any web, any, any cloud server in the world and, and, and interchange with them. So uh, to me, I don't see three as really fundamentally a problem. Three is more about, you know, do you let your banks do that or do you let your government do that? Uh, so again, I don't think, I, I just think it's simpler than what a lot of these countries think. However, I do think the one issue that's, that is more complicated on our side, and I'd like to hear anybody respond to that, and that's the, uh, uh, the fact that we have, uh, I think, very inconsistent and, and, and wrong-headed rules with regard to the Electronic uh, computer, computer Privacy Act, where under the current U.S. rules, your data stored, so I, I, have a, I actually have a, a, a machine at home that is, I can store data on, and the government can't come in and look at it unless they have a search warrant. But when I put it up into the Google Cloud or the iCloud, the Microsoft Cloud, they now have a much easier time looking at that. And to me, it's like the only difference is one's connected, it's a machine here, and the other is connected with a wire, this machine a thousand miles away. It's still my data. So can you, anybody want to comment on that? It's sort of I, I, to us, that's a big, big problem. And the federal government seems to be in a conflicted mode, shall we say. Um, I, I think I'm going to pass on uh, editorializing because my wife sits as a U.S. Court of Appeals judge sits on some of these cases, and uh, while I know actually I'm totally an idiot on the subject, uh, people often think I'm expressing somehow household hands. Well, Michael, you don't have a wife on the on the court, so I <laughs> put you on the spot. Uh, I, you know, uh, one of the, one of the questions is who really owns the data. I think the European principles that the data is actually owned by the individual, as opposed to the aggregator of the data. Um, if we were to apply that in the U.S., that would actually have a lot more concept of protection. Uh, right now, any data that is collected in the process of my transacting with a company, the company theoretically owns. They can market it, etc. So I think that's 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 one issue. That, you're right. It's a funny, blurry line uh, between the two, um, and I think it's it's got to get resolved. Otherwise, it's going to really paralyze a lot of commerce, especially as we get into much more sensitive data. And as one of my colleagues used to say, at some point there'll be a data Valdez where a company is going to spill all this data that's going to be really sensitive, medical data or something, and then we'll start to really worry about this in a big way. But until that happens, I don't think people are really going to wake up to it. I, I would just pick up on some of the telecom comments we had before, and telecom is the principal legal intercept. There's a very well-established legal right to basically uh, find the government to find its way into some of communications channels. And if you want your data secure, you don't take it anywhere except for in your hand. 
that's how it works. As soon as, right. as, soon as you're on a cloud, you're subject either to cyber inspection or uh, intercept by whatever force. And there, today there are no protections that mirror what has been put in place for telecom. I, I do think that one point I can make is that, the, uh, the, as you suggest in your opening comments, Rob, this emphasis on the Patriot Act is a, a, a red herring. Uh, for reasons we uh, explained in our papers, in fact, most, uh, just take democracies, most democracies operate under a parliamentary system where the executive branch has far more discretion than the United States government does. And so the Patriot Act is actually a more transparent system. I'm not saying what the rights or wrongs of the system are, but it's a more transparent system actually than we're seeing in many other democratic uh, societies. So uh, it's not the Patriot Act that's the problem. It's really the substance of the balance that's there. And I think that that's your right to be pushing that. Yeah. because. Uh, I think we would have we would be on much uh, surer footing if we had our own house in order on the, on this point. And uh, Michael, on my own view is, if, you know, if I have data on, on Amazon because I bought a book, you know, in my view, it is their data. But if I'm storing my photos on a photo share, or uh, you know, when I when I upload to uh, uh, Dropbox, that is my data. It's not Dropbox's data. It's my data, and there's no difference between I'm just renting I'm just renting a little piece of their hard drive. And I connected it with a wire, no different than when I own the hard drive. And that's the part I think that fundamentally U.S. policy doesn't understand, that there's a conceptual difference there. So it's not like we have to close down all access to government data in those other areas. But this particular thing, when it's your data and you're just having somebody host it, to me, that's what's the fundamental difference. Yeah, but I'm not sure how many people have read the EULAs regarding most of these cloud services in terms of the responsibility and the authority regarding the data. I mean, well, private is different. Uh, don't get me wrong, but but that's yeah. The, the use agreements are different. All that fine. Eh, that's fine. But th we're talking about public government access okay. with a completely different standard for when I have those files, those photos of my daughter on my computer, versus when I have them up in a in a cloud shared system. There's just why are we treating that as if somehow it's different? To me, that's a that is that is applying a technology standard, not. A performance standard. Can I comment on data a little? Can I bit? Not be the last point. Go ahead. Just really, just really quickly. Um, to, to your point, I think the way data is discussed in the cloud environment or on the whole international policy is sort of as a blunt instrument. All right. And if we were to sort of balkanize data the way some people or some countries are talking about, you'd shut down a lot of international electronic commerce. You know, you can't have any data outside the country. And there's actually tremendous gradients on on data. Um, within personal, actually, there is some stuff that most people would give away. You know, my name and address, probably it's publicly available. Some things we're very sensitive about, financial and medical being at sort of the other extreme. But in reality, you know, if you, if you work with governments, I'm involved in Africa rolling out a mobile health application in nine countries. And seven of them originally said, no, the data can't leave the country. Until we talked about the deployment and the economics and how it was going to be encrypted. And this is the Ministry of Health and how we'd interface with their system, and all of them ultimately, save one, said, yeah, that's probably a better way to do it, as long as we have a way to audit and safeguard it, et cetera. And so it, it, it seems to me that there's a lot more finesse that would be beneficial in discussing the data issue, rather than data can't leave the country or data can go, all data can go across borders. And I, and I haven't heard that really discussed. And it's not a technological fix, right? It's really an understanding of some's more sensitive than other, and there's ways to deal with it that the parties that are responsible have to have sit at the table and really discuss. No, that's an excellent point. Uh, so this was a great, great panel. I really enjoyed it, learned a lot. And I want to thank uh, Peter and uh, Michael for this great paper, which I would encourage you all to read, and uh, uh, Mendel and, and Ken also for joining us and Bernie. So please thank the great panel, and thank you all for coming.